Good morning, everyone. This is Nicole with the Florida Restaurant Lodging Association. We're sorry you can't see us today. We're having a little technical difficulties, but you can see the presentation, which is the most important part. I'm going to start our presentation by just saying thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and joining us today on this incredibly hot topic. We know it's, um, I work with our Florida Inns chapter, which is the smaller, um, lodging, independent lodging, and bed and breakfast properties in the state. So this is definitely a hot topic for us. So I thank our speakers for taking time and putting this together. I have to read a little housekeeping items and then we will get started. The information provided here is for educational purposes and FRLA does not warrant or endorse any particular provider. FRLA is prohibited from providing specific legal, financial, or accounting advice and the information represented here is not intended as such. FRLA encourages businesses to consult competent advisors in these fields to explore their specific situation. This webinar is being recorded for future use by the association and other industry members. Participation in the call is deemed to be your consent for recording. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today. We've got um, great speakers here from many different fields to help us with this topic. We've got Betty and Kevin from the law firm Jack Johnson Jackson. And they'll discuss the um, impact of the Gill versus Winn-Dixie stores and what it did to the website lawsuit business. John with Square One Architecture will discuss the physical features. You will need to be on the lookout to avoid an ADA liability lawsuit. Micah from Adelaide, who will discuss what you and your web developer needs to think about when maintaining your website. And finally, Nathan with ResNexus, who will discuss what you need to know when taking reservations from guests with disabilities. So at this time, I will turn it over to Betty. Thank you all. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, like Nicole said, we're really excited to be here today and, and share um, a little about the ADA and some uh, website accessibility requirements. So as I'm sure you know, the ADA gives civil right protections to individuals with disabilities. Um, however, ADA's compliance is simultaneously straightforward and vague. So businesses are required to provide disabled disabled individuals with equal access to their goods, services, and physical location. So it sounds pretty straightforward, but as you probably know, it's it's not. Um, so the ADA outlines specific rules for constructing facilities that are accessible to users with a wide range of disabilities. But when it comes to websites, the ADA does not set specific requirements or guidelines to making a site accessible. And this, uh, this gets many companies into legal trouble as their websites may not be compliant, yet they have no way of knowing. Uh, because the Department of Justice is responsible for enforcing the ADA, it issues regulations implementing the legislation. And this includes regulations about website accessibility. Um, so over the years, many high profile names like Home Depot, Beyonce, Domino's Pizza, and large hotel chains have been sued for ADA website compliance. Uh, but despite these bigger names gardening national media attention, the vast majority of defendants in ADA website compliance lawsuits are small to medium-sized businesses. And penalties, fines, and settlements are extremely extensive in these cases and can wipe out small businesses completely. And many courts hearing these cases um, have treated websites as public accommodations. However, a case coming out the 11th Circuit in Atlanta has called this into question. Uh, and that is the Gill versus Winn-Dixie case. So in 2016, Juan Gill, a blind man, filed a lawsuit against Winn-Dixie stores. Uh, Gill was a frequent Winn-Dixie customer, but could not access Winn-Dixie's website using screen reader software, which prevented him from finding coupons, locating nearby stores, and refilling prescriptions online for in-store pickup. The case went to trial in 2017 in the Southern District of Florida, where the judge ruled that the inaccessible website violated Title III of the ADA. And the court interpreted the ADA broadly and reasoned that the services offered on Winn-Dixie's website, such as the online pharmacy management system, and the ability to find store locations and the opportunity to access digital coupons provided a sufficient nexus to the physical stores. Now, though a website might not be a physical location, the inability to use the website meant blind customers did not have full access to the store's offering. And the court did not answer the question of whether the website was a physical accommodation, but reasoned that um, the website was so integrated to the physical store and served as a gateway to the physical store locations. Now, the court ordered with Dixie to make it accessible, to make its website accessible under the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, which I know Michael will address later. 
uh, and Winn-Dixie appealed the 11th Circuit uh, Court, uh, appealed the, the court's decision to the 11th Circuit Court, which has appellate jurisdiction over Florida, Alabama, and Georgia. And one of the most pertinent questions of that case was whether Winn-Dixie's website was a place of public accommodation under Title III of the ADA. Now, in April of this year, in a 2-1 decision, a split panel of the 11th Circuit ruled that websites for businesses that are generally open to the public are not places of public accommodation under the ADA. The court reasoned that the ADA lists types of locations that are tangible, physical places, uh, so places you can walk into. And pursuant to the plain language, the court found that public accommodations are, are limited to actual physical places. And the court stated that Winn-Dixie's website is designed for limited use, unlike other websites. So the court analyzed uh, the Winn-Dixie case to a case where a production company's phone system was the sole access uh, point designed to pick contestants for who wants to be a millionaire. And that same phone system was, the, was inaccessible by individuals with hearing impairments. So the court found that these cases were different because even though Winton Dixie's website was limited and inaccessible to visually impaired individuals, it did not function as an intangible barrier to an individual accessing the goods, services, and privileges or advantages of Winn-Dixie's physical store. Further, the website um, does not provide a point of sale function, so all purchases must be done in store. Nothing prevented Gil from shopping at the physical store. And now we compare this to other cases like, uh, like a Domino's case out of the Ninth Circuit, um, where the court there held that uh, Domino's Pizza's website uh, was a public, accommoda a, a public accommodation because the, the plaintiff in that case could order pizza from the website and he was unable to uh, because he could not use his screen reading uh, software. Now what the court giveth, the court can take it away. And although the 11th Circuit has ruled that websites are not public accommodations, it does not mean the debate is over. Uh, because you see that 2nd and 9th Circuit courts have ruled that websites are public accommodations. Uh, so you see how that can be a problem when one part of the country says websites are public accommodations and the other one says no, all while interpreting the same federal law. So what happens now? Uh, the plaintiffs in the Winn-Dixie case have requested a rehearing on Bonk. And so this means that instead of just being before the three judges in the 11th Circuit, they have requested to appear before the entire circuit court. And they, um, the entire court will then determine whether the three judge panel that initially ruled on the case uh, was correct or not. If the en banc panel affirms the three judge panel's decision, then it is likely that Gill will take this case to the Supreme Court. And regardless of whether the Supreme Court decides it uh, or hears it, the ADA can also be amended by Congress to include or explicitly exclude requirements for website accessibility. So what does this mean for now? Uh, the question remains whether a hotel's website is more like Winn-Dixie's or Domino's. And so, you know, we continue to recommend that you continue to ensure that your website is in compliance with ADA compliance uh, with ADA re regulations as this is this case, the Winn-Dixie case, is unlikely to stop plaintiff's attorneys from filing lawsuits. And one thing to keep in mind is when trying to make that comparison is whether your reservation system through your website uh, is an intangible barrier, meaning if a blind person can't buy a room you know, through your website, would that be enough to establish coverage under the ADA? Um, so, you know, today we'll continue to discuss some um, requirements for website accessibility and we'll focus on the main requirements dealing with physical features you need to be on the lookout to avoid ADA liability and what you and your website developer need to think about when maintaining your website and what you need to know when taking reservations from guests with disabilities. And with that, I'll turn it over to John from Square One Architecture. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Beatrice uh, or Betty. Um, uh, so yeah, today I'm gonna go over some of the physical features of accessibility at um, lodging facilities. Oops, sorry. Um, sorry, I'm being asked to show my screen, but I don't think I want to. Sorry about <clears throat> Sorry about that, Betty, it's back to you. S 
Sorry. Do we have do we have the slides? Betty, can you just share your screen again? I apologize. Well, while we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, I'll just I'll continue talking about what I was going to talk about. <laughs> okay, so um, my portion of the uh, the ADA physical features for lodging facilities. There's a few things I'm going to go over, and I'm going to try and go over them pretty quickly. Um, they are. Uh, some data uh, from the uh, the federal courts, the Florida district courts, um, and um, <clears throat> some key aspects of the ADA standards, um, how not to invite lawsuits uh, related to physical features, um, and some common ADA questions for lodging facilities and some low-hanging fruit for lodging facilities as well. So, Within the federal courts that are in Florida, the Florida district courts, um, my office took uh, a lot of time to sift through all those cases and um, and get a sense of how many of those cases are um, uh, were, were filed against lodging facilities uh, by year. And looking at 2019, 8% of the cases were filed against lodging facilities. In 2020, it was 10%. So that's a 25% increase. Um, and those numbers alone, eight and 10% um, are pretty high when you consider that 6% um, of the businesses in Florida are hotels and motels, I'm sorry, 0.6%. So less than 1% are hotels and motels, yet we're seeing 10% of the cases filed against lodging facilities. So it's pretty dis disproportionate and tells us that you know lodging facilities have been a target. Um, some key aspects of the ADA standards, um, grandfathering, uh, this is, grandfathering does not exist, it's, it's not a thing that exists within the ADA um, Act or the ADA standards, um, and barrier removal has been an ongoing obligation um, of any place of public accommodation since 1991. Uh, here we go, I'm seeing a presentation come up. We can go to, go, sorry. There we go, one more, yes, okay. <clears throat> oh, pack one, please. So, um, yeah, since 1991, um, it's been an obligation of business owners, places of public accommodation to remove barriers, um, regardless of you know when the facility was built. Um, there is another mechanism within the standards um, that is called readily achievable. Um, if you have an older facility that predates the, uh, you know, the, the act and the standards, um, there's an opportunity to say, you know, uh, th this is not easily, well, here's the definition. It, it means easily accomplished um, or carried out without much difficulty or expense. So if you have a case filed against you, you may be able to fend off that case and settle by saying that, you know, for example, you can't increase the size of your restroom to fit a wheelchair because you can't move the walls. It'll be too difficult and too expensive, uh, there, but it comes with baggage uh, in the future. Uh, if someone else walks in and sees the small restroom, they can file another case. So uh, it's a useful tool when you have a case, but it's but you still have exposure if you don't address the, uh, the barrier that exists. Um, and this list here of 21 items, um, are some items that the Department of Justice has said, um, these are things that you, you must do. You cannot claim that they're, that they're not readily achievable. And they mainly, the key ones I think have to do with um, access, so parking spaces and site access, including ramps, curb cuts, um, widening doorways. And then there are some easier things like repositioning shelves and telephones, um, but those are things that they're, they're saying are not, uh, that cannot be considered not readily achievable. They are readily achievable. Uh, let's go, yeah. So this is a little diagram that I want to kind of give you some insight as to my perspective, because I, I do a lot of the, I handle a lot of these cases and many of them 
you know, it's pretty obvious that some of the, the people um, looking to start a case will target certain properties um, based on what they can see from afar or a bird's eye view. So if you kind of imagine zooming back even further to like a Google satellite view, you may see that a lodging facility with a pool either has or does not have uh, a pool lift, or you'll be able to see if there's accessible parking. You know, you might not be able to tell if it's compliant or not, if it has the proper slopes and striping and signage, but you can see if it's there. You can see if there are curb ramps, you can see if there's, you know, easy access into the building. So that's kind of the, the first layer. And as a uh, potential plaintiff, um, walks on the property, drives on the property, enters the property. They can see more and understand more as they enter the door into the lobby. They'll have more information and understand more. But some of these things can be seen from afar and some of them you have to get into um, the facility. And if, if someone sees from afar that things are addressed, they might not you know, put you on their hit list as a target. So I think that's important information for business owners to fend off lawsuits next yeah so some common questions um that i hear from lodging uh owners managers you know how many mobility rooms do you need and this is a table that comes directly from the ada standards the 2010 ada standards which is the latest and greatest there's only been two versions but that's the latest uh, many of you might fall in the, you know, one to 25 guest rooms or, you know, maybe up to 50, but you can see you need the, the right hand column has the total number of mobility rooms. The center columns are the number of rooms that need roll in showers or without roll in showers. If it's not a roll in shower, then it needs to be a transfer shower. But, you know, that information is available in this chart. Let's go move on. Another question there's also the florida building code accessibility portion has a requirement for uh five percent of the guest rooms to be uh like a light version of ada it's it's the florida building codes requirements it goes beyond the ada standards um but this is this is five percent of the total rooms minus the number of mobility rooms that you just saw on the previous slide so this really doesn't come into effect until you get um, over 200 rooms, if you do the math, looking at that, that chart. But the light version is grab bars at the toilets and, and bath um, and open bed frames so you can get a lift in at the bed and uh, a toilet or a water closet with a seat height of 17 to 19 inches. Uh, let's move on to the next. So another question uh, similar to the mobility feature rooms, how many communication feature rooms are needed? And these communication feature rooms would have alarms with visible signals. Um, the most common example is a fire alarm, uh, notification devices uh, for telephone calls and uh, a, door, a doorbell or door knocker that have visual um, notification. Um, and these things, actually, you'll see later, that they sell kits and these are actually pretty easy things. Many facilities have them and they, they forget they're in storage, but they have them. <laughs> But the number, again, there's another chart in the standards um, that just lets you know how many you need. And then some of the low hanging fruit, um, these are the things that should be relatively easy to do um, and you know, will be helpful when it comes time you know, on your websites to uh, list the accessibility features, um, to know that you can easily put in grab bars at the toilet or in the uh, showers or bathtubs. Um, and then all operable parts of, of anything throughout the room, um, like uh, closet hanging rods, light switches, um, drapery wands, all those things. If you look at the bottom right there, uh, there's a reach range when there's no obstruction in front of you, no countertop or you know nothing in front of you, then um, reaching forward from 15 inches above the floor up to 48 inches is where those operable parts should be that someone could reach. Uh, other low hanging fruit, uh, the kits I mentioned, some of the stuff's a little bit outdated, but the kit on the left there um, has the hearing impaired you know, phone system. I think a lot of people 
just use their cell phones now, which are much more advanced. Um, but you can see the fire alarm uh, with the visible uh, notification there. Um, but again, those kits are available on Amazon and other places. Um, the door levers, uh, all the door levers, not just entering the room, but to the, the bathrooms. Um, so it's a, a lever you want to be able to use one hand and open it or uh, open the door with um, either an open uh, palm or a closed fist. Um, someone that uh, has had strokes, they have uh, problems grasping things. So, so and, and yeah, that's the other thing, sorry. Uh, you can't, you shouldn't have to tightly grasp or twist it. Um, and portable showers, uh, I'm sorry, portable uh, tub and shower seats. Um, that's something, again, it's often in storage. Some places, some facilities have them and they, they forget they're in storage. But, you know, when someone requests them, you need to have them available and the right number of them. And some, some of this information you can find um, in the standards, you can find on these websites, ada.gov, accessboard.gov, which is the organization that created the ADA standards. FloridaBuilding.org has the Florida 5% that I mentioned, um, and some good checklists there too. So just some good resources for everyone. And that's just my contact information. If you have any questions, actually, it, uh, it was mentioned earlier. If any questions come up for any of the presenters, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll try and address them. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Micah, you're up with Adelie. Awesome. Hey, everybody. My name is Micah Uehara and uh, I work with a company called Adelie. We do deal with digital accessibility. Uh, for websites and and um, applications and such, and so um, I'm wanted to kind of think about what I could present today in regards um, to you folks, and uh, I thought that it would just be a good idea to kind of come up with some um, questions that you can discuss with your web developer or web designer today, um, specifically to do with um, your website and uh, web accessibility. So um, this is going to be a really high um, level overview um, for you folks. So um, uh, the very first question that um, I think it's really important to start a discussion with your um, web developer, web designer, is just being very direct and asking them which um, WCAG or WCAG standard that um, they are using. Um, for your website. And for those of you who um, don't know what the WCAG or the WCAG is, it's an international set of standards um, that is um, set apart by the governing board, the W3C, um, in regards to um, website content accessibility um, guidelines for your website and, and um, web apps. And so um, depending on um, the what your um, understand your web designer or web developers understanding is of accessibility this will be a good gauge to see if they um, know a little bit about accessibility um, and if they don't then it would be um, I, you know recommended that you look for a web developer or a web designer that actually understands a little bit about accessibility so I'll just go into a little bit about what this standard is um, what you should what our recommendation is um, for the standard that you should be following within this so within the WCAG or the WCAG um, there are different levels um, the latest level is 2.1 it came out in 2018 I believe um, what we recommend as a base minimum um, that our um, our customers and clients are using the WCAG 2.0 standard. Um, and within the standard, there's different levels. So you have um, the A level, which is the least strict, and you have a double A and a triple A. So at a bare minimum, um, we recommend uh, users and our clients to have a level 
uh, WCAG 2.0 level AA. And what that means is, is it, it just means that you are a little bit stricter on what you're conforming to. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So at a very base level, the, the, the WCAG 2.0 level A standard um, deals with things such as um, making sure that your website can be um, navigated with just a keyboard or other input devices. Um, you have video captions on your um, any videos um, that has um, audio and talking. Um, and so these are very low level and low um, entry um, issues that you can take care of on your website. The, the AA um, level um, within the WCAG 2.0 is a little bit stricter. It goes into um, more, it, it, it adds things such as contrast colors between um, your text and your background. So it, maybe you have some um, images that you've overlaid with some text and things like that. And if you don't have enough contrast between the colors, it makes it very difficult for um, users with certain types of disabilities um, to be able to see and to read that information. And so um, this is one of kind of like a little bit stricter um, conformance that your website needs to be. The other um, things that AA um, standard has is also making sure that your form fields um, are labeled correctly, that you have um, headings that are in logical order. It's just, a, it's just a checklist. So if you were just to do a Google search, there's tons and tons of information about the um, WCAG or the WCAG standard. Um, it's definitely worthwhile for you to understand what those are and uh, having that discussion with your web developer or your web designer um, would be uh, would be really beneficial to you. So the next question that I would ask your web designer, web developer would be, um, are you relying on any overlay products um, for accessibility on our website? So what an overlay product is, is there's a lot of companies that have um, technology where you just insert a piece of code. Um, it's a bit of JavaScript that goes on your website. Um, you've all seen them. It, it will show a little icon that has a set of tools um, for people with um, certain types of disabilities. You can increase text sizes, you can change contrast, you can change um, different um, visual um, aspects. Some of these overlays um, have screen readers built in. Um, from, a, from a high level, it sounds great having these overlay products, but the problem is, is that um, these types of technology does not make your website um, accessible or compliant with any type of ADA. Um, it may help some users with certain types of disabilities. Um, our company, Adderley, we have a free um, accessibility widget that we offer users, but we're we're very clear in letting people know that this does not, number one, protect you from lawsuits. Um, it does not make your size, um, your website accessible. And so if your web designer or web developer is using this as their end-all be-all strategy, um, I would definitely recommend into looking for a new web developer or a web designer. Um, because these types of technology will just, it, it doesn't work when it comes to the accessible side of things. Um, like I said, it, it may help certain users with certain types of disabilities, but from, um, if you're trying to really be serious about making your website accessible to those with disabilities, this is, this is not the way to go. So that would be my, um, my second question um, that you should ask your web developer. Generally what happens if you ask your web developer, hey, I need to make my website um, ADA compliant, the very first thing that they'll do is they'll do a Google search and these things are all over the place and um, this is what their solution that they come back with and they'll say, hey, you're good to go, but um, that's to be taken with a grain of salt and, and uh, now you know a little bit more about that. Um, the next question would be is like, how are you um, asking them, how do they test for accessibility? Now, there's a lot of different ways to um, test for accessibility. There's a lot of online tools that will, um, you know, scan your web pages and tell you what types of 
um, issues there are. Um, some tools are better than others. We offer um, accessibility testing um, with some automated tools, but the best type of tool is actually doing manual testing. Um, you'll be able to um, test for and see um, the actual user experience. And so we do a mixture of, of both um, at Adelie. Um, we do automated testing, but we also do live person testing. Um, we use different input devices. Uh, we use different screen reader technologies. Um, and um, that's the best way to really gauge how well your website um, is actually doing in regards to um, accessibility. The last question um, that I would suggest asking your um, web developer is, is, hey, you know, what, what type of monitoring um, do you have for accessibility? Um, a lot of people think that, okay, I've made my website accessible, that's great. I don't have anything to worry about. Um, but then they have some updated images or they have um, a new field on a form that they they need to start gathering and, and using on their website. And they forget that a website, especially in today's day and age, is kind of a living um, and uh, breathing thing. And so when changes are made to the website, um, whether they be a small change or a large change, um, you know, when you're adding new room descriptions or those types of things, um, you are introducing um, and could potentially be um, creating your website um, issues when it comes to accessibility. So we recommend having active accessibility monitoring, meaning that if any changes are detected on your website that um, um, the monitoring will be able to tell you whether or not your website um, pages are still accessible. Um, at Adelie, we do have a product um, that will monitor your website 24-7 um, and detect any ADA issues um, in real time. Um, so there's kind of peace of mind um, there. So um, those are the four questions that I would recommend asking your web developer. And if you have any uh, questions, feel free to let me know. Thank you so much, Micah. And we have uh, Nathan next. Awesome. Thank you, Betty. Um, I'm just, uh, let me see if I can take control here and go over some things there. Um, it's thinking about it. There we go. Let's see here. All right. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see uh, this website. Uh, and thank you, Mike. I think that was uh, those were great points. I wanted to go over, uh, maybe show some of the things he was talking about. Um, I find so I'll, my job today is to talk about. Um, more on your online booking engine, but it, it, it closely aligns with your um, website as well. Because a lot of times, um, if you're getting a legal notice from someone, they don't make that distinction. But I wanted to go over some of the things that even Micah just said really quickly. This is what he's talking about as far as being an overlay product. This is called um, the user way app. This is uh, free, but what people do use is they use this to, um, for de depending on their disability, do uh, have some tools that that uh, modify your website without you having to do anything to it. Um, they're useful tools, but like Micah said, they're not an end-all be-all. And if you just put this on your website, it doesn't guarantee that you'll be ADA compliant. It is something nice to, to do, and it does help in that regard. Um, the other thing that uh, is generally the biggest thing that uh, with ADA compliance or some big ones that we find when we're doing websites that people miss is uh, having alt tags over your pictures. So if you hover over something, and I did this as a sample, um, like if I click on this, it says placeholder up here. This is a this is an alt tag or basically for a screen reader that people who have um, disabilities um, with uh, the visual disabilities it reads what the what this picture is and you want to put a good description in and I'll show us a successful example of that as well the other thing that makes it hard is although the WAC or the ACG um, 
guidelines are in place and are internationally uh, you know, recognized. The problem is the Department of Justice has that as a de facto, but they haven't come out and uh, said what is the what is the absolute standard that we have to follow. Unlike with physical ADA on website ADA, it's more nuanced and it it does evolve based on technology. But there's not a hard and fast standard. So, uh, like Micah was saying, a lot of times it is just how usable is it. But the clear ones are if if you can tab and and use the keyboard to do different different things on your websites um th then that's a good one the other thing is those alt tags that i was mentioning on pictures and having enough contrast and and some other technical things when it comes to your booking engine <clears throat> there are some so with title three there are some things that happen in that domino case that i see a lot with res nexus that comes up and that is um, they basically usually have uh, on the on the lawsuits that I see, they basically do uh, two or they do uh, and, and we have this on a slide later in the presentation. But basically what happens is they have uh, these sections that they they usually list on people who have an, uh, a website or a booking engine in violation of what they consider to be ADA. Um, and so basically wanted to go through that and show you what they mean by this. So basically uh, the first one that they come up is modify its policies, practices, or procedures to ensure that individuals with disabilities can make reservations for accessible guest rooms during the same hours and in the same manner as individuals who do not need accessible rooms. So this came from the Domino's case. Basically, remember they mentioned, hey, I, I want to order online just like anybody else. You, if your website allows you to shop online, it can't exclude uh, someone based on a disability. So they need to be able to perform the same functions. And that's what kind of happened with that Domino's cases. Domino's argued, hey, they can call into the store and still get a pizza. But the person was like, no, I want to be able to use your app to do it. I don't want to have to call. Um, therefore, it's discriminatory. And so basically, uh, if, if, they, if, if they need to be able to book a room on your, on your website, they need to be able to book a room on their, their website. So that's what you allow. Um, and that's, that's pretty easy. Then the other thing is that you need to identify and describe accessibility features in the hotels and guest rooms offered through its reservation service, in enough detail to reasonably permit individuals with disabilities to assess independently whether a given hotel or guest room meets his or her accessibility needs. Um, this was mentioned earlier. But one of the things that you want to do is uh, you want to identify a room or unit that is your ADA accessible room or unit. And then also with that, you want to be able to um, put on that room that you, uh, you know, if I click, if I click on this room and get more details on it, it should tell me, you know, how big the interest entrance way is, uh, what kind of handles they have, if they have those grab bars, you need to put those on there if, if you have that information so that people understand because there's people with dis different disabilities. We all, almost always go to like the wheelchair and that's a good one to go to. But like I said, there are people with visual disabilities and so, uh, or people have had a stroke, they can walk just fine. They just maybe have problems with it. So you just want to put what it is uh, that makes this your ADA accessible room. You would also want to put um, the, the other thing that you want to put on your website, I'll go back to that real quick, is at the bottom of your page or somewhere on your website. There we go. For some reason this is interacting weird with the screen reader uh, of that. You'll want to have um, an ADA uh, uh, accessibility statement that uh, what do you do to have, uh, what are you doing to accommodate those? Depending on the size of your property, are you exempt from it? Um, one of the things on the federal Title III that you're exempt on is that if you have a, uh, if you're an owner-occupied property with more than five units, or uh, then you do have to follow ADA compliance and if they live on prop, but if you're five units or less and you live on property, um, then you don't have to do some of the ADA compliance 
Um, also, if you're a religious organization, there's some exclusion, as well as historic properties. But with historic properties, um, they're exempt from certain aspects of Title III, but not necessarily all of them, especially when it comes to getting into the building, uh, as was mentioned earlier. So you'll want to have this on your on your website somewhere. And we also recommend that you put it on your if if you have it, put it on your online booking engine. Like I said, this go to webinars doing something funky with my my preview here. So I would recommend you put it on your 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 booking engine as well. Uh, with ResNexus, this comes automatically, and we do it, and we also handle any, uh, and we and we set that up for you. But going back to the individual room, you'll want to put those you'll want to put those descriptions that are on that room. The next thing that you want to cover is basically the third thing is ensure that the accessible guest rooms are held for use by individuals with disabilities until all other guest rooms of that type have been rented. And the accessibility room requested is the only remaining room of that type. So basically, if you're a smaller property, you can't rent out this ADA accessible room unless it's your last unit. You have to have the technology on your booking engine to be able to do that, or you have to provide notice of that. So one of the things that uh, we recommend is that your online booking engine um, basically says this unit is reserved for customers with what happens is a pop up comes up and says, and you can change this message depending on your, your website provider or if you're using ResNexus, you can modify this. But our default one is this unit is reserved for customers with disabilities. If you do not have accessibility needs, please click cancel and select another unit. If you do not meet the ADA requirements for this unit, it is not and it is not the last unit available. We reserve the right to change your reservation to another unit without your permission to accommodate customers with qualifying disabilities. So this, this is a necessary um, this is a necessary um, warning that you do and also a legal description that lets you um, do what you need to if someone has it because on this guideline basically um, uh, three and five go together in the sense that you have to guarantee that that accessible room is is reserved for someone with special needs and if you have a, a scenario where someone walked in that needed the ADA room um and it was a and it was booked but you had another ada room not available uh you would move that guest from that ada room uh that doesn't need the the that doesn't meet the ada requirements to the to the non-ada room and put the other person in that's what's required by uh this guarantee that specific accessible guest room reserved through its reservation services held for the reserving customer so regardless of whether a specific room is held in response to reservation made by, by others. And that's why that disclaimer says that, say, hey, you're saying by, by checking this room, you're saying that this is our ADA accessible suite. You're understanding that you have needs that qualify for that. And if you don't, we reserve the right to move you out if we need to. Now, if you're booked 100% occupied, then you're fine. Uh, but if you're not on this day and that happens, this is a complete outlier scenario. How often is going to happen? Not very often, but you are covered with that. Hey, we reserve the right to change your reservation if if someone needs it. And then the other thing is um, reserve upon request accessible guest rooms or specific type of guest rooms and ensure that the guest rooms requests are blocked and removed from all reservation systems. So basically, um, if you need to you would want to remove the uh, once it's reserved you can't show this ada room anymore um, that's pretty common with any room that a that a booking engine does but these are some of the things that you want to look for on your booking engine the other thing is because people don't make a distinction between your website and your booking engine it follows the same kind of things that you need in the sense of for example when i o overlay this um, on the picture, it said it, it that's the alt tag that's popping up in that green section, it, uh, or sorry, in that blue section, queen bed with white walls and colorful paintings. Um, if I do the next one, it will do picture of luxurious white uh, and black bathroom. So this is things that are needed for the screen reader. Um, if if you want to be able, you'll need alt tags on your pictures. Um, you can have default ones. This one 
is not an ADA room and it's not uh, as awesome. It's image one for queen two suite, queen suite. That will get you by, but that's not a very good user experience. <laughs> so if you can, you want to modify those and, and you're able to. And again, the same thing is if you if you have those uh, that user way widget or or uh, that you can put on your booking engine, you'll want to do that. That just does make it a little bit easier um, for the user experience as that goes. Um, and that's about uh, that's about it for the uh, how you make your booking engine and your web. Uh, I mean, a, a brief overview, but how you make your booking engine ADA compliant. And some of the things you can do. I do want to mention that was mentioned earlier. One of the things on your website or your booking engine that people do that we've noticed um, is of the advocacy groups that target our properties are, are generally what I find is they they come along and um, there's someone that not necessarily even wants to stay at your property, but they go to book on your website and they see if you have a room that's designated. If you're talking about on your website how to how are, where the wheelchair ramps are and those different things, if they don't see it on their website, then like as mentioned before by um, by John, um, they'll start to ta they'll start to target you. And um, like for example, this picture is a beautiful picture, um, but they might start to target you because they don't see a, a a ramp or a a lift that's on the pool. So just be careful when you're putting on pool pictures or those different things. If it's not in the picture, maybe you put that in the alt tag, a picture of pool with lounge cha cha chairs and has accessible lift or something like that. That's how you avoid the the, the drive-by um, lawsuits that we see that are prevalent um, where people are targeting you and then they, they go and do that. Um, hopefully as it goes up the courts as mentioned before, some of the frivolous lawsuits will be dropped um I, I know that i've seen it's usually the same person suing hun, you know hundreds of properties over and over again uh, uh saying that they they wanted to stay there but they never book uh, they're just looking for those infractions and a lot of times they're just looking for you to settle and not go to court um or to go get or to be overwhelmed in that emotion that happens on there again i'm not providing legal advice but just know that that's what they're looking for when they're targeting your business and I'll go ahead and turn the time back over to Betty. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, and I think we've um, come to the end of our program. Not sure if, um, if any of y'all have any questions. Um, get put in the questions bar. I know Nicole's gonna take over now. Betty, while yes, people are typing in questions, can I summarize real quickly? Yes, of course, Kevin. Sure, so this is Kevin Johnson and I work with Betty at Johnson Jackson. And just as a quick summary of what we've talked about today, you know, sometimes we have clients that come to us and say, well, I don't understand why I've got another ADA lawsuit coming. You know, I worked with you last time and we got all the rooms fixed and we got the ramps built why am I still getting sued? And the reason we have three different experts on this call helping us today is because there's really three different buckets that you have to take care of in, in terms of being fully covered. The first one is your physical layout needs to be completely accessible, or at least to the standard of, of readily achievable. And that's where you would call John or someone like him and get help with your physical layout. The second thing that you need to cover, your second bucket is your website needs to be accessible to people who are visually disabled or have other types of disabilities that affect their ability to use it. And so that's why you would call someone like Adelie. And finally, your reservation engine needs to be set up so that you're taking reservations in the right manner and you're saving rooms and doing that according to the rules set out by the DOJ and their regulations. And that's why we needed ResNexus to help us talk about that. So there's three different buckets that you have to cover and you have to get all of those taken care of before you're in compliance. And that's why it's important to know how all these fit together. I wish we had better news for you on terms of, you know, that this was definitely all going to go away. Realistically, we think that, you know, there's gonna be, you know, further challenges to uh, the 11th Circuit's ruling. It's going to have a tough road to hoe, both at the en banc setting and probably at the Supreme Court. And even if it survives to the Supreme Court, 
I would bet that we'll see some legislative action to try to uh, bulk, bulk up the ADA, just like they did the last time when, when Congress got unhappy with how the courts were interpreting the ADA, they stepped in and expanded the definitions. So I think you can expect that that's probably what we're looking at over the next several years. And there's every incentive to continue focusing on website compliance and on overall ADA compliance and trying to get it right in the meantime. So do we have questions? This is Nicole, and at this time, I don't see any questions in the question box or chat. Just give everybody another minute or two if you have any you'd like listed. Great. Well, thank you all for being with us today. We will send out a copy of the presentation and a copy of the slides um, this afternoon to you all. Thank you again. And thank you to our presenters. Thanks, everyone. Yep, thank you.